It's September 13th, 1970, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. When former Harvard psychology lecturer and notable LSD proponent Timothy Leary was imprisoned for possessing marijuana, this so-called high priest of drug culture reached out to his followers to help him escape. And today in history, in 1970, they obliged, when drug trafficking organisation The Brotherhood of Eternal Love and far-left Marxist militant organisation The Weather Underground provided him with a cable to jump the prison wall, a getaway car, new clothing and false ID papers. Now, admittedly, Leary was walking away from a minimum security prison. It was the California Men's Colony West in St. Louis Obispo. But the escape itself was at least kind of spectacular because Leary hoisted himself up onto a rooftop over a telephone pole, shimmied along a cable across a prison yard and then over the barbed wire and then jumped down onto the highway beyond where he was picked up by this group of helpers who squirreled him away and took him to his next destination. Yeah, not before he had time to leave a note for the guards containing an amusingly self-aggrandizing passage in which he compares himself to Socrates, Jesus and the victims of the Holocaust, um, as well as a (laughs) newspaper clipping taped to his lock which was from a article quoting Ronald Reagan, then governor of California, as saying that Leary was not a security risk and should be placed in a minimum security prison. So he had a lot of time That's to quite prepare. Funny. Yeah, his little, <laughs> his little taunting kiss off to the guards. He'd also been training because he wasn't a young man at the time. He'd been training to climb over a 12 foot chain link fence to get to the highway outside. Uh, the weathermen then smuggled Leary, picking up his then wife, Rosemary, uh, and they went to Algiers. They went to live with Black Panthers, who'd set up basically an HQ in Algeria. But they found him so annoying that eventually he had to move on. There was a lot of personality clashing, and that began a two-year wild period of time on the run all over the world. Well, we'll get to what happened next later. I suppose we should, for people who don't really know, tell you a little bit about Timothy Leary, who he was, and why he ended up with a long-term prison sentence for marijuana possession. It's a minor misdemeanor, really, so... Why did he appear to be public enemy number one of Richard Nixon's presidency? Well, he was a major countercultural leader, I suppose, of the 1960s. I mean, he was there when John and Yoko did their anti-Vietnam bedding. Mm. And he'd got that reputation after having in the 50s tried mushrooms for the first time in Mexico, having a kind of mind-altering experience and then meeting the head of the Harvard Psychedelic Project, who invited him to form this new department of Harvard that would be looking into the effects of LSD. Now, at the time, this wasn't unusual in itself. The US government spent an estimated $4 million funding over 100 studies like this. What was unusual about the way that Leary conducted his business at Harvard is that in his case, he and his fellow profs were dropping too much acid themselves for <laughs> for their work to be considered really credible science. Yeah. And his term as a lecturer was terminated. And there were also implications that he had been uh, soliciting sexual favours uh, from students. And so there were a lot of reasons why Harvard eventually wanted to dismiss him and his colleague Richard Alpert, uh, with whom he'd started to do this research. Yeah, I think it's really easy to picture all of these uptight dons, you know, with their monocles popping out saying, mm. this is most unorthodox. But His experiments were wildly unethical by the standards of today. He also didn't get institutional approval for a lot of the experiments, and he didn't turn up to a lot of his scheduled lectures. He preferred hanging out with his new beatnik friends like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. So then he and Alpert basically were sort of forcibly launched into new careers as countercultural gurus. You know, their high-profile experiments and then also high-profile firing had attracted the attention of wealthy patrons, which enabled them to set up their own private research facility. Yeah, and one of those facilities was uh, Millbrook in New York State, outside which the FBI first started investigating him. They used to strip search his guests on their way into his compound. So they knew, and the police knew, that this countercultural figure 
was, from their point of view, essentially dealing hard drugs. Mm. Um, but they were finding it hard to pin anything on him, and they kept arresting him for things like marijuana possession. What was obvious, really, was that powerful forces wanted him to shut up. He also split up with his brief second marriage, and this is really where a decade of legal troubles begins for Leary. He was first stopped in Texas with a small amount of cannabis and was convicted on several charges. But while that verdict was on appeal, the Millbrook house was raided and Leary was actually roused from his bed and arrested by uh, G. Gordon Liddy, who pops up (laughs) elsewhere in history in a fascinating role in the Watergate affair. He was then part of the Duchess County Sheriff's Department. But basically at this stage, Leary had sort of embraced this career as a full-on showman, you know, love-ins and be-ins and so on. He'd started a church called the League for Spiritual Discovery. So he really had strayed a long way from his roots as an academic. And when he married his third wife, Rosemary Woodruff, in 1967, the event was actually directed by Ted Markland of Bonanza fame, and all the guests were on acid. (laughs) I mean, you can put, and all the guests were on acid at the end of pretty much everything that he was involved in at the time. Exactly, yeah. Leary's often credited with coming up with the hippie slogan, you know, the turn on, tune in, drop out, which he did say in an address to 30,000 young hippies at the Human Being in Golden Gate Park in 1967. But he actually said he got the quote from Marshall McLuhan. But even so, he was very much associated with the whole countercultural movement. Did the drop out mean drop out of the draft? Um, or did he just mean drop out of like mainstream conventional culture? life? I think because there was a point where right. Leary was talking about himself before he started doing mushrooms, and he described himself as being a robot living the life of a middle class drone, you know, drinking heavily. So it was that kind of suburban living, and I think that's what really frightened the Nixon administration. Richard Nixon mm. called him the most dangerous man in America. But then the question is, if he was the most dangerous man in America, how did he end up in such a low security prison? The reason is that he manipulated the psychometric tests given to new inmates, one of which was literally the leery interpersonal behaviour <laughs> inventory. So he had come up with it himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, that had been his specialty before he got into LSD and psychedelics. He was doing psychometric testing. He knew what the answers were in a way that got him landed in the lowest security penal colony that there was. The thing is, it's, it's tempting to look at that rhetoric, the most dangerous man in America, especially coming out of the mouth of someone like Nixon, from this perspective and be like, how ridiculous, how uptight they were. But actually... You know, what he was advocating was dangerous for people who then might, for example, get in a car and drive or engage in a sexual experience before the age of consent, etc. I mean, he dubiously claimed that a 15-year-old would be the perfect age to have a trip and specifically linked the benefits of psilocybin from magic mushrooms with sexual experience. I mean, he used to write for Playboy and Hustler and this kind of godlike awakening as well. He was the first to argue that psychedelics could not just be a potential treatment, but as something that could elevate you to being more insightful, more spiritual, an an elevated level of consciousness... And that is a dangerous thing to tell children. And the Brotherhood of Eternal Love is actually a really good example of how something so utopian and idealistic can actually become something quite horrible and scary. It had started as a hippie commune in the mid-60s in Orange County. And their whole thing was that, you know, they had a passion for promoting psychedelics. They genuinely believed that it would improve society and the world. The problem was that they wanted to flood America with drugs, which meant that they ended up becoming a drug manufacturing and distributing network to the point where they were eventually nicknamed the Hippie Mafia. They were, you know, a criminal organisation by this point and it had all started from this place of you know we need to spread these drugs and that very quickly became we need to make and sell these drugs. And you can see how all of this adds up to a worldview that was very different to that of the leader of the Black Panther Party Eldridge Cleaver who uh, Leary encountered once he got to Algeria and quite quickly fell out with after he arrived there. So he ended up going to Afghanistan he was captured there and in 1973 that's when he was returned finally to the US and he spent three more years in California's prison system and was ultimately only released in 1976. After he spent some time as Charles Manson's neighbour. Right, yeah. In prison. I mean, he really does just coincide with absolutely everybody you've heard of from the 60s. (laughs) Like, it's the most astonishing run. Yeah, when he was picked up at Cavill Airport in 1972, his bail was set at $5 million. That's the largest bail for any private individual in US history. And this is all over what began as two butts of marijuana cigarettes roaches. Yeah. It, wasn't even a, it wasn't even like a bag of marijuana. It was two cigarette ends. 
Yeah, once he finally got out of prison, the last two decades of his life were sort of divided between his home in Beverly Hills and the campus lecture circuit. He also tried comedy clubs too. Yeah, including this sort of bizarre touring double act with G. Gordon Liddy, who you mentioned earlier. He arrested Leary when he was in the sheriff's department. He then later went on to become one of the Watergate burglars and then a right-wing radio host. So they would go around together offering their opposite opinions on every subject under the sun. He was fascinated with the internet. He called the PC the LSD of the 1990s and he kind of reworked, I mean, he'd sort of lost his edge by this point. He reworked his famous catchphrase as Turn on, boot up, jack in. And at the end of his life, he started to get particularly interested in the kind of interface between drugs and technology and death. He actually said, I'm looking forward to the most fascinating experience in life, which is dying. You've got to approach your dying the way you live your life, with curiosity, with hope, with fascination, with courage, and with the help of your friends. He also approached it, it must be said, with a hell of a lot of drugs, (laughs) because he actually set up a website all about his death, which was leary.com. And there he greeted visitors cheerily with the records of his drug intake, which at this stage mostly consisted of cigarettes and coffee and wine, but also included marijuana, cocaine, nitrous oxide, and a not immodest list of pharmaceuticals as well. Yes, he kind of developed this uh, obsession with uh, assisted suicide, basically, planned death, although actually he died peacefully in his sleep of cancer in May 1996. He did have one of the most uh, fun post-death uh, <laughs> um, <Go on. laughs> stories that we've ever covered. Do you know what happened to his his remains? So part of them were given to Susan Sarandon. What? <laughs> who was um, a, a fan of his. OK. Who, who took them to Burning Man and drank them um, in a toast to him. <laughs> And the remainder of his remains were blasted into space with Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry. Oh, wow. I just think he would have approved of every single part of that. (laughs) (laughs) Tomorrow. At the time, the cannons that the British were using were really, like, ferociously inaccurate. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.